Hey, all right, Romans 13, 8 through 14 today. So if you don't have a Bible and you'd like one, raise your hand. We do plan to go through the Bible and to teach the Bible. And so um, if you would, you know, it's always a good thing to bring your Bible to church. Just by the way, I'm not trying to pick on anybody that didn't today, but <coughs> bring a Bible. You know, we're going to get into that thing. So Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 21. Now, they're getting you one. I hope that you had a wonderful week this past week, and I hope that you call your week wonderful because you spent much quality time with the Lord. Did everybody have a good week? Was it because you were in the Word? Was it because you were spending time with the Lord? I certainly hope that's the case. Well, before we get into our message today, I'd like to uh, tell you a story about a friend of mine. He's a duck, and he went into a corner store the other day to grab a snack. And as he came up to the counter, he said, hey, will you just put it on my bill? <laughs> I have the best debts in the world. Every single one of them is outstanding. <laughs> I almost took out a loan last night. I had a near-debt experience. <laughs> I'm so much in debt, I can't afford to pay my electric bill. These are the darkest days of my life. <laughs> well, you probably noticed a theme going through all of these. I guess since you are bright thinking people this morning that you've noticed the theme of debt. And today's message deals with the subject of debt. But you know, we're not going to talk about financial debt. We're not going to talk about financial obligations. We are going to talk about a perpetual obligation, one that is never fulfilled, a God-given obligation. We're going to talk about an obligation that if everyone would take it seriously, the world would literally change overnight. We're going to talk about an obligation that if we are going to survive as people, we must respond to with urgency our God-given obligation to love. It goes without saying that these are dark days in the world, in the United States, men and women repaying evil for evil. Those conformed to the pattern of this fallen world, killing one another, robbing one another, hating one another, those that at one time had a sense of brotherhood, a common bond between all humans. They're becoming indifferent, slothful in their love. Those that one time looked you in the eyes and said hello as they passed you on the sidewalk now keep to themselves, barely noticing that you're there. It seems tragically that the obligation to love one another is fading it's like looking out into the field, as I remember as a kid, from my grandfather's farm, and there was a time when you noticed all the fireflies stopped giving their light as the night got cold. Love is waxing cold in some places. How should God's people meet the dark night? How can God's people fulfill their obligation to love? We're going to find that out today with a few helpful points in these few moments that we have together. God has placed the obligation on his people to love others with a sense of urgency, leaving behind works of darkness and walking in the light. What I want you to do today, which hit me this week just extremely, that there is an obligation to love people simply because they're people, because they're created in the image of God, Jew, Gentile, Greek, Italian, black, white, rich, poor, male, female, all of that. There is an obligation to love all people simply because they're people. 
That's what God's going to instruct us to do. I, that hit me really big time this week that every person that you come in contact with, every person you see in your life, you have an obligation, a God-given obligation to love those people. Everyone, every one of them in front of you. This hit me in an all-new way this week. And I have to be honest, what, the first thing that hit me was just the conviction of my lack of love. And no, I'm not overtly mean to people. Almost a worse kind of a lack of love. Indifference. Indifference. The sort of thing that won't necessarily spend the time to look up from its phone. Just simply to say hi to somebody else. Indifference. The sort of indifference that thinks, you know, it's not important to hold a door for somebody anymore. That sort of stuff. Indifference. And I had to confess to the Lord that just like Jesus Christ said would happen in the end times, that love would wax cold because sin would be so rampant. I had to examine myself and say, you know, I am seeing elements of this setting in in my own heart. And this passage confronted me with my God-given obligation to love others. And I pray that God gets a hold of you and all of us today so we can fulfill our obligation to love. Let's look at our outline today. It's simple. Well, it's simple in the sense that it's three parts, but it's kind of wordy. But as thinking people, we can... Get through it, no problem. Number one, verses 8 through 10. We must fulfill the obligation to love because love is the fulfillment of the law. Number two, verses 11 through 12, because love is the, because we need to love one another because the fulfillment of our salvation is near, right? Number three, we need to fulfill the obligation to love because the fulfillment of our flesh's lusts is not proper. The fulfillment of our flesh lusts is not proper. So it's kind of a wordy outline, but I think you understand the point. We must fulfill our obligation to love because love is the fulfillment of the law. We must fulfill that obligation to love because the fulfillment of our salvation is near. We must fulfill our obligation to love because the fulfillment of our flesh lusts is not proper. And I didn't want to make it too wordy, but you could add at the end, for Christians. Number one, love is the fulfillment of the law. Verse 8 says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Owe no one anything except to love one another. Now, right off the bat, this is not a command to abstain from financing anything. There are certainly, I'm sure there are well-meaning teachers that teach this as a passage, and they say, they take only that part of it. Owe no one anything, and they say, Christians are not supposed to finance anything. That's not what this passage is talking about. I will make a comment about this. Although the Bible does not prohibit financing, it is certainly a Christian ethic to be people that don't just have outstanding debts. If I have a debt and somebody is sitting somewhere saying, that Adam, he sure owes me that money and he doesn't even mention it. Every time I see him, he acts like he doesn't even owe it to me. Well, that's certainly not what God would have for Christians. Even if a person makes a phone call and says, hey, 
I recognize the fact that I owe you the money. All I have is 50 cents. I guarantee you the person on the other end of that phone would receive that as a gesture, as a good gesture. They would say, that is a good gesture right there. And that brings honor to our Lord. This passage, however, is not dealing with, it's not saying you can't finance anything, but it is a good Christian principle for Christians to be, you know, people that pay their debts, of course, or taking steps to do so. What this is getting at, you know, pay all other debts, but the debt of love is never paid. It's perpetual. Let no debt remaining, let no uh, debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. That's what Paul is saying. Oh, and he, oh, no one anything except to love one another. And this is a perpetual debt. This is a debt in perpetuity. It means it keeps going. There's no fulfillment ever of this. You never get to the point to where you can say, you know, I have fully loved people enough and now I will just go back to being selfish. It doesn't get to that point. No. What does he mean by love? Well, we've examined a few weeks ago the four different types of love in the Bible. And if you were here, you, you know, we were kind of enlightened by uh, just the Greek language expressing these different types of love. And so you can imagine the word that he's talking about here is the word agape. To love, to agape someone is the action of the will to behave in the best interest of others simply because it is right. It's not inactive, but it's active. Humans are created in the image of God and are therefore to be loved and respected. And we are to take the initiative, an act of the will to love people. That's what agape is. He says, oh, nobody, anything but to love one another, but to take an action of the will to always do what is in the best interest of everyone around you, right? It's tall call. God has certainly called Christians to a higher way of living. God wants us to see the debt, the obligation of love as perpetual. Now, I know that uh, men and women are very diligent to pay their material debts, but how are they doing on paying the debt of love? Love, as we see, starting in verse 9, is actually the positive side of God's law. I'll show you what I mean. Verse 9, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, covet. If there's any other commandment, they're all summed up in this, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Paul then quoting various specific commands from the social section of the Ten Commandments. You know what I mean, social section? Some of the Ten Commandments, the first ones are dealing with our relationship with God, and the next ones are our vertical relationship, if you will, and the next ones are dealing with our horizontal relationship. And so Paul here, he quotes some specific commands from the Ten Commandments dealing with our horizontal relationships, our, our social relationships one to another. His point is this, love is the fulfillment of all of the negatives of the law. You see here, I'll help us understand. People that love their neighbors, do they want to sleep with their spouses? No. You don't need to tell somebody don't commit adultery if they love people, because if they love people, they don't want to destroy anybody's marriage. Do people that love their neighbors murder or hate them? Well, no. You don't need to tell somebody don't murder. Thou shalt not kill. Oh, good, because, you know, I was... Uh, you say, well, I've never killed anybody, but you know what Jesus says? Jesus says, if you've hated anybody, you've committed the sin of murder as far as he's concerned. But see, you don't have to tell people that love people not to hate people. See, they're doing the positive, right? Do people that love their neighbors steal from their neighbors? Well, no. So you don't have to say, do not steal. You don't, have to, you don't have to tell that to people that are filled with love. Love respects and rejoices over another's marriage. Love wants to help and to build another up. Love respects another's property. Love values and stands on truth, so it doesn't need to be told not to lie. Love does not seek its own, but seeks the good of another. 
is what the Bible says. Now, the reason that God has to lay down the negatives in the Old Testament law is because of sin. Now, if sin had not come into the world through the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, if we all hadn't been tainted because of our spiritual parents in the Garden of Eden, God would have had to tell us, don't do this and don't do that, would he? We would love. This is why we ought to fulfill the obligation to love one another is because love fulfills the law. It is those who fail to love that need to be continuously told, don't do this, don't do that. Stop doing this. It is those that fail to love that need to be constantly told to stop what they are doing. Laws are for the lawless. People who choose to love don't need to be told, to be honest, not to hate people, not to steal from people, not to lust after another person's possessions or sleep with a married woman. They don't need to be told these things, right? You see, love is an inspiration rather than a restraint. Love is an inspiration rather than a restraint. Love is a positive. Love is the only positive in this world. Love fulfills the law of God. Love, not merely an external conformity to rules, is the essence of God's law. Love is the highest plane of living because it is that which our Lord lived on. This is how he lived. Verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. I had to laugh the other night. I was at work and this grandma checked in. And, um, you know, you see all types coming out of the cars that have been on a road trip for a long time. Grandma comes up to the counter and I said, are you, che- you going to check in? And she says, Yes, if I don't strangle these kids first. (laughs) You know, and you're thinking about the six-hour road trip that she had just escaped from. And you think about the principle of love. If the kids in the back seat would love one another, grandma wouldn't have to keep turning around saying, will you quit picking your nose and wiping it? On your sister? I mean, if people would love, they wouldn't have to be told not to do things like this, would they? Now understand, we can't do this perfectly. There's only been one man to walk this earth that could. Jesus' death on the cross on our behalf would have been unnecessary if we could love perfectly. It is really our failure to love that our Lord died for, and he lovingly did. His act of love is the only thing that could heal our lack of love. But by the grace of God and the power of His Spirit inside of us, you and I can love. Although not perfectly, but by the power of His Spirit and by the act of the will, you and I can love. We must fulfill the obligation to love because love fulfills the law. Number two, We must fulfill the obligation to love because the fulfillment of our salvation is near. Verse 11. And do this knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Look at those three words in verse 11. And I just want to draw attention to these for a second because it's a good reminder to us that Christianity is not only studying doctrine in a room full of other Christians. That's not all Christianity is about. Look at these three words there. Paul says, and do this. Christianity is action. It's action. It's not sitting around talking, pretending that we're concerned about something when all we're concerned about is something other than what God would have us to be concerned about. When really the chief desires of our lives are not those which the Lord has bought us with his blood to fulfill. 
The Bible says, don't you know that you're not your own, that you were bought with a price? You and I were saved. You and I were saved from the power of sin, from the destiny of hell that all of us would face without Jesus Christ. And we were saved for a purpose and we were saved to serve. And so Paul says, and now do this, do this. And he goes on to say this, knowing the time. Now he's not referring to time in general here. He's not saying, what time is it? Well, it's a hair past the freckle, you know. He's not saying that it's, you know, 2.30, He's talking about the time referring to the end time, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. He's saying, in this time between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ, do this. This is what we are to be doing, is what he's saying. He said, we're not to be getting together and just having a potluck and socializing. Those things are excellent. We need to do those things. They're excellent. But there's more. There's more for God's people. There's more that God has called us to. He's called us to be a people of action. And he says, now do this because the return of Christ is imminent. Do you know what imminent means? It means it's definitely going to happen and it may be really soon. That's what it means. Now, let me make a pause here real quick. No one knows the day or the hour. And there are people that are interpreting the signs of today and they're checking into, you know, they're, they're, they're looking as the imminent return of Christ as a reason to do nothing. And that is not God honoring. That is not God honoring at all. Read the book of Thessalonians. Read what happened to people that checked out and just started freeloading because they said, well, you know, Lord, you know, it's going to come back and take heck with it. It's not what we're to be doing at all. People have thought the world was going to end multiple, multiple times throughout history. And you know what? You keep on going. You keep on doing this, as Paul has said here. Do this. That's what he said. No. He says that we need to awake out of sleep. We need to awake out of sleep. In other words, here's a wake-up call to some people. That's what he's saying. Now, Paul may have written this into his letter here because maybe the Roman church was, you know, falling asleep. You know, he anticipated. He's like, well, I did write Romans. It's there in the 13th chapter here. Maybe they're falling asleep. You know, maybe I should write this. And now wake up out of sleep, right? Maybe he anticipates somebody just kind of, you know, drooling and dozing off and, you know. I don't think that's what he means, though. More likely, he means something different by telling the Romans to wake up. Paul is likely dealing with their spiritual complacency, not literal sleep. It's hard to imagine spiritual complacency setting in only about 20 years after the birth of the church, isn't it? The book of Romans is not that far from the cross. Isn't it hard to imagine spiritual lethargy, apathy setting in already? So Paul has to tell them, it's high time to wake up out of your sleep. I think this is such a message for the church today. It's a message for me today. Wake up out of your sleep. Reminds me of the poor gal that came to the pastor one day and she says, you know, I hope you didn't take it personally, pastor. You know, when my husband walked out during your sermon. The preacher said, well, I did find it pretty discouraging. And she says, well, it's not a reflection of you. He's been sleepwalking since he was a kid. (laughs) Men and women in 2020 need to hear the alarm, don't they? To wake up. Don't they need to hear that? I need to hear that. I need to be woken out of my sleep. If I want to be honest, I've been kind of lulled to sleep. Like the rest of my American brothers and sisters, most of us, been entertained to death. Comfort zone. It was becoming more of a cocoon than a blessing. Sleeping when you should be awake is dangerous. I used to have a friend in California, a roommate of mine, and uh, right when I met him, he went to jail. And then a year later, he got out. And I was finally able to ask him what he went to jail for. He was, it was literally the day I was moving into my house, Cardinal Avenue, Huntington Beach, California. He was make, moving his stuff out. And then I was like, well, it's nice to meet you, Sean. And um, anyway, a year later, he comes back and he moves back in. And I was finally able to ask him what he went to jail for. He fell asleep at the wheel in Hollywood, California. 
and he drove up on the sidewalk and he killed a woman and her daughter. Woke up in jail the next day, didn't know what happened. They told him, they said, I got to tell you something. <laughs> Sleeping when you should be awake is dangerous. The church has been sleeping when it should have been awake. Some parents are sleeping when they should have been awake. Do you know that 90% of kids, according to one study in 2012, 90% of kids ages 8 to 16 have seen pornography? 90% of kids 8 to 16 have seen pornography. Tell me some parents aren't sleeping while their kids are just... 90%? That's 9 out of 10 kids! <laughs> Some spouses have been asleep when they should have been awake and their marriages are falling apart as a result. Some youth have been asleep, lulled to sleep by their devices. They don't even know how to be content. They're continuously bored, discontented, don't even know how to entertain themselves, not developing talents, patience, all these other virtues that are being taken by the devil as we're lulled to sleep in America by our entertainment and technology. While the church has been sleeping in this country, universalism's moved in, abandonment of the sufficiency of the word of God, self-help and psychology have moved in, the occult's moved in, new age, astrology, ungodly accepted lifestyles have all moved in while the church was sleeping. Paul says it's high time for Christians to awake from their slumber. One night I woke up in the middle of the night to my stepmom yelling, and apparently my dad had... Well, he saw a mirror in front of him, and so he figured it was the bathroom. And it turns out that it was her antique vanity <laughs> with all of her makeup and everything everywhere. And uh, my dad decided, you know, sleepwalking, that he was, just had to go to the bathroom and all over all of her stuff. And oh, my gosh, you know. <laughs> oh, my Lord. It's funny the things that you can do while you're sleeping, though. You can walk while you're sleeping, right? You can certainly talk while you're sleeping, I have heard some things out of my wife. I'm like, oh my goodness, you know. You can talk while you're sleeping. I think you can sing while you're sleeping. I think you can have the reputation that you're awake while you're sleeping. The Church of Sardis did. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. I think you can be sleep giving, sleep attending. Sleep parenting, sleep working, sleep living. Paul tells the Romans, what I need to hear today, what maybe you need to hear today, what maybe a lot of churches need to hear today, is it's time to wake up out of spiritual apathy. It's time to wake up out of complacency. It's time to fulfill the obligation to love that God has put on every single one of us. He says that our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. That's the reason. You know, the first day that you started believing, the day after, you were closer to your salvation. What, just so we're not confused, what he's talking about that your salvation is near? Salvation exists in three tenses. You're justified when you first come to Christ. You confess Jesus Christ as Lord. You ask for forgiveness. You surrender your life. Repent of your sins. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. You're regenerated. You become a new Christian. That's justification, step one of salvation. At that moment, immediately, you enter into sanctification, or otherwise called pro progressive sanctification. That is the process whereby you are now being delivered from the power of sin in your life day by day day in different ways. You're becoming more and more like Jesus Christ as you render the old man to be dead. And as you walk by the spirit, you confess your sin and repent. That's called sanctification. And the third one is called glorification. Glorification is when you're finally delivered from the presence of sin altogether. Number one, the power of sin you're delivered from. Number two, or I'm sorry, the, the penalty of sin is number one. Number two is the power of sin daily, progressively. And number three is the altogether the presence of sin. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying it's time to wake up because it's coming close to where you're going to see Christ face to face. And you're going to be like him because you're going to see him. And you're going to be delivered fully from the presence of sin. And if that's your eternal destiny is to be delivered from the presence of sin completely, then what does it make sense to live in these works of darkness now? It doesn't. Live like who you are is what he's saying. If this is your eternal destiny and it's nearer than it's ever been, today you're closer to it than you were yesterday. He says, it's time to wake up. He says, it's time to wake up. 
It's time to wake up. The day is drawing near. We're one day closer than yesterday. Verse 12, this should cause us to live in constant expectancy. Look at verse 12. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. He's referring to the time that we're alive now. It's called the church age, the time between the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's referring to that as the night. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. The day is when Christ will uh, come back. His second coming, this is the day. This is the full salvation, the glorification when we're delivered completely from the presence of sin. He says the night is far spent. Therefore, what should we do because this is the case? Cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 says, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. 1 John 2, 8 says, Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The night is far spent. 2 Timothy 3.13 says, But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The night is far spent, isn't it? You turn on the television and you see that the night is far spent, isn't it? And the day is approaching. The day is at hand. But you, brethren, Paul says to the Thessalonians, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. I love what Malachi 4.2 says. Listen to the way that Jesus is described here, talking about his second coming. But to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. This is the imagery of a soldier. It's very biblical to see yourself as a soldier in a battle. You're in an epic battle between evil and good. <laughs> There's a spiritual battle going on. You know what the enemy's tactic is that he's using so, against so many soldiers that have refused to put on the armor of light? He's using sleepiness. <laughs> he's lulling us to sleep. And the thing that's sad about it is we're volunteering for it. We're volunteering for it. Everything from what we eat to what we watch, all of it, we're volunteering for lethargy. He's using the image of a soldier. You should see yourself as a Christian, as a soldier. Onward, Christian soldier. You remember that song? Now, we're not talking about going out and fighting with weapons. We're not talking about any of that stuff. The Bible says that our weapons are mighty for pulling down strongholds, but they're not carnal weapons. We need to see ourselves as soldiers of love. Soldiers of love. Fulfilling the obligation to love. Going out and intentionally loving. He says, put on the armor of light. Cast off works of darkness and put on the armor of light because Jesus' return is imminent. That's what Jesus meant in John 14 when he said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That is coming. But we're in this time now of where we're to live for Christ, to wake out of sleep or to love people or to share the gospel with people. And that's what he's encouraging us to do. Wake up is what he's saying. Every Saturday we have a prayer meeting here Erin um, and I come and pray for an hour, and she sets her alarm and, um, for 1 p.m. And that thing goes off, and I, I just, it's kind of, I don't, I mean, she hates the sound. I kind of laugh at her, though. I don't mean to, but, you know, we'll be praying, and all of a sudden, her alarm will go off. And, she, you know, it's the, it's the sound of her alarm clock when she wakes up in the morning. And so it's like, you know, she just hates the sound. She'll jump like, oh, I hate that sound, you know. But some of us need to hear that very sound. Some people were starting to wake up when I was yelling about it two seconds ago and have already started to go back into it. I'm not talking about physical sleep. I'm talking about the determination that the flesh and the devil are making together to not fulfill the obligation to love. That's what's going on. 
Christians are sleeping. He says, man, hear that alarm sound. Oh, I don't, I don't like that sound either. I have a very pleasant sound on my alarm, so I wake up and I'm like, yes, that's pleasant. I don't like hers, though. Paul sounded the alarm here today, and some of us really needed it. It's time to fulfill the obligation to love. Now our final point. We must fulfill our obligation to love because the fulfillment of our flesh lusts is not proper, which is really the only option. Either I'm going to go love people like Christ has said, or else I'm going to selfishly fulfill the desires of my flesh. There aren't really two things going on. Verse 13, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness or lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Clear directions from the apostle. He says, let us walk properly. It's similar to what he said in verse 12, cast off the works of darkness and walk in the light. He says that that is proper. It's proper to walk in the light. The Bible says this, if we say that we have fellowship with God and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So Paul is saying it's very appropriate for a Christian to walk in the light because if a Christian claims to be in the light but continues to walk in darkness, he says, John said in 1 John, he says, you lie. You're lying. You're not in the light. He's very cut and dry about it. It doesn't mean the Christian doesn't stumble. It doesn't mean that sin isn't a reality for the Christian, but sin is not the norm for the Christian. And willful disobedience to the Lord is certainly not the norm. I'm not saying we don't all choose to sin when we're tempted, because it's always a choice. But there's a difference between saying, I know what God says and I don't care. There's a difference between that and saying, oh, I want to do the right thing, but my flesh is weak, I confess. He says it's just proper for Christians, verse 12, to walk properly as in the day. And then he lists some sins there, not in revelry. King James Version has it translated rioting, and it's like, huh, that's really, isn't that something? But it doesn't have to do with the rioting like you see on TV. This kind of rioting, the Greek word would more or less mean um, something like Mardi Gras, you know, like a, some sort of like lewd rally, you know, going and doing things that we don't want to speak of here. Drunkenness, simple, right there. The Greek word just means intoxication of any kind. Not proper for a Christian. Not in lewdness or lust. Lewdness is just kind of given over to like, you know, when you're around a lewd person, well, you know, just kind of a lewd, they're always making, you know, sort of off-color jokes. They're just, you know, that's lewd. Lust, this word translated lust here has to deal with um, just kind of sexual, sort of erotic sort of lust. Not in strife and in envy. I like how he ends with those two. Because maybe somebody's listening to those first four and going, ha, I don't do any of those things. What about strife and envy? <laughs> those are kind of more of the respectable sins, aren't they? And he ends with those. He says those are not not proper. He says, but rather, verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh. What does it mean to put on Christ? Now, this is something I've been struck with lately of how much that I personally have overcomplicated Christianity in my life. You know, it's like, okay, let's get in this big wrangling about the timing of the rapture. It's important. It's an important doctrine. It really is. Okay. Let's get in. Let's talk about, you know, predestination. Let's, let's get into all these lofty theological concepts. Let's stir them around. Let's feel good. We'll hang out together and then, you know, we'll go home and, you know, we'll just continue on in our way. But what does it mean to put on Christ? Well, that's some of it. Some of it is to be concerned with doctrine and, and things like that. And that's, that's very good. But I think I've totally overcomplicated this. You know, if you were in Galilee in the time of Jesus and um, he came up to you, he would say, follow me. <laughs> and you'd get up and you'd just go, well, okay. And you'd start following him. You would just start going where Jesus goes. You would start doing what Jesus does. That struck me the other day of how profound is this as a Christian to, you know, you have to forgive my, you know, I don't even know what the word is for it. I'm, tr I'm not trying to be condescending. I'm just you know, talking to myself, you know, of like, how complicated we make things. Jesus says, follow me and do the stuff I do. 
People will say, well, what does it mean to put on Christ? Why don't we just do a, let's do a Greek examination of the word put on and let's think, is this kind of a thing where I, you know, uh, is this a metaphor? Is it a metaphor for something? Do I metaphorically put on Christ? Or is it, you know, is there some sort of ritual that I need to take part in? Or uh, <laughs> Do what Jesus does. There you go. <laughs> That's what the Lord's been telling me. Adam, it's this simple. Do what I do. What did you see me do? Well, Jesus went out and he cared for the sick. He cared for the poor. He cared for the oppressed. He cared for the downtrodden. He encouraged people. He taught people. He served people. This is what it means to put on Christ. It's not complicated. Oh, man, I made it complicated. If I want to be perfectly honest, I might have made it complicated because really I was just being lazy. You know, just talking about myself here. I don't know if that relates to anybody else, but I mean... Gosh, isn't it scary to do the things that Jesus did? Because they involve a whole lot of work and <coughs> effort. Some people overcomplicate Christianity. Why don't we just put on Christ? Then he goes on to say something that is just a key in being delivered from the things that Jesus is delivering you from. And he says, make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision for for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Now, this has the idea of, you see, my flesh lusts, it wants what it wants, it's selfish, it wants to sin, it wants to, um, uh, you know, it just wants to serve itself. I could go down a whole list of sins that it does, you know, outbursts of anger, different stuff like that. The flesh wants what it wants. And I'm to make no provision for those things. I'm not to sit in my mind and give any thought about how to fulfill these sinful things in my life. I'm not to leave a door open to these sinful things. This is like somebody that's trying to quit drinking, but they've got a bottle hidden out in the garage because they're scared that they might not make it without it. This is like a person that is struggling with pornography that refuses to get rid of their smartphone. It's like a person that wants to cut off an adulterous affair but refuses to give the apartment key back to their girlfriend. These are people that are making provision for the flesh. Paul says, don't even do that. Get it out of your house. Stop doing it. Stop thinking about it. Stop planning and making provision for what's going to happen when you might fail. Stop looking to these things as crutches. And stop, start leaning on Jesus, the only crutch that will really hold you up. Everybody has a crutch, but only one crutch holds you up. And that's what he's saying. Don't, don't make any provision for the flesh. Don't keep that line of communication open. Don't do that. He uses the illustration of garments there, and it's funny. It just makes me think about the other night at work that there's these guys staying at my hotel that work for a landscaping company. And part of being a landscaper, I've learned, is putting manure on everything, I guess. And these guys come in after a long day of work, and they'll check into the hotel. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Checking them in and... And then they always ask for a garbage bag. Can I get a garbage bag for my clothes? And they want to put, thank you, you know. But then they'll go, you know, to their, and, and it's amazing just the whole kind of attitude I get towards them because, I, mean, I mean, we're talking manure on the face, you know, just, you know, look like, uh, you know, look like Biff Tannen, you know, sliding into the back of a, uh, the truck down on Main Street, you know. And um, they'll go to the room, take a shower, put on some new clothes, come out, and you don't even recognize them. That's what Paul's saying here. You should see that old man, that sinful old man with all of its lusts as a dirty, filthy, stinky garment. And you should put on Jesus Christ instead. And I think he says this like this for memorability. You know, he gives us this picture because I guess that what you're going to do is you're going to go home today and you're probably going to change clothes before you go to bed. You're probably going to put on your pajamas. Mike's going to put on his footy pajamas. No, <laughs> he probably don't have those. You know, but I guess you're probably 